Okay, good. So, so welcome to the, the CIQC uh, colloquium. So today we have the great pleasure to, uh, to have uh, Mohamed Afezi from uh, the University of Ma Maryland for his talk uh, entitled Quantum Optics Meets Correlated Electrons. So we give a quick introduction of uh, Mohamed and, uh, and the introduction of the talk today will be uh, done by uh, Marcus Bins, who is a graduate student in uh, Berkeley Physics. So Mohamed uh, is, I mean, studied for two years at Sharif University uh, before completing his undergrad uh, degree at uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, in France. So he received his PhD in physics uh, from uh, Harvard University in 2009. So he was a senior research associate at the Joint Quantum Institute before joining the faculty of uh, UMD. So his group aims at the theoretical and experimental investigation of uh, quantum properties of light matter interactions for application in classical and quantum information processing and sensing. So he received a Sloan a research fellowship and uh, the Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award. So, um, so just a quick reminder for next week. So the colloquium next week will be uh, by Jarod McLean from uh, Google Quantum and the introduction will be done by Gregory uh, yeah. So I will just quickly also remind us of the structure of the uh, colloquium. So um, the first 20 minutes will be uh, a, an introduction to notion that we've been needed for uh, Mohamed talk. So that will be done by Marcus, as I said. And uh, then the seminar, and we'll have after that uh, a, a discussion for about 20 minutes. So very importantly, you know, after this discussion, the student and postdoc will remain. Uh, we stay here with Mohamed to uh, more discussion. Uh, and at that point, I will ask uh, that uh, PI uh, leave uh, the Zoom call. Okay, so with that, uh, so the floor is yours. Marcus, uh, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Thank okay, you. Great. Okay, great. Yes. great. Um, let's see if we can properly share screen. It was working earlier, and I hope it's still working now. Uh, it seems to be. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, as uh, Bobakar has, has told us, um, Professor Hafezi will be uh, discussing some applications of quantum optics techniques to strongly correlated electron systems. So for this introduction, since um, I think looking at the past CIQC talks, there hasn't been too much um, on this quantum optics topic, I, I think that's sort of I wanted to give uh, a bit of a blitz overview of some of the essential ideas and techniques that have um, come from this field over the past almost um, century now. So um, one motivation to, to think about um, quantum optics is the fact that in, in the world we live in, all of the materials that we would um, build a quantum computer out of, or um, you know, even something much simpler like a chair, they tend to be made out of atoms or you know, more generally out of some nuclei and electrons. And pictured here is a uh, rubidium atom, which is neutral, it has no net charge. And so it's thought to be, it, you know, it's generally regarded as something that's, um, you know, very weakly coupled to the environment. Um, nevertheless, you know, any atom is, is, is not just its, its nucleus and the electrons uh, attached to it, but also the electromagnetic field that um, uh, binds the, the whole thing together. And the thing about the electromagnetic field is that it's an incredibly complex quantum system um, pervading all of, of, of the space around us. It's you know, some huge assortment of, of quantum modes that are you know, very um, complicated. And everything in the universe uh, interacts with it, you know, um, either because it has some uh, direct electric charge, like you know, a fundamental electron or a, a quark inside a nucleus. So basically, all material stuff, but even more exotic particles that particle physicists think about, like neutrinos, will also, even if somewhat indirectly, interact with the electromagnetic field. So there's this giant quantum system that is is just out there, and we should try at some level to think about, you know, how it affects the more um, controlled stuff that we, we normally prefer to think about. So there's kind of, I, I think, three main themes of um, the way that this um, electromagnetic field can influence um, your system. 
your material system. The first is by acting as some environment for the system under consideration. And this is uh, uh, like a photon bath. You have this huge set of modes and you know there will be some interaction between them. The second idea is to use um, just some classical light. So to kind of forget about um, the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field and just realize it's some tool that you can use to control or drive your system. And then the last thing, and, and probably the most interesting, um, is to actually sort of directly make use of the quantum nature of light and try and isolate from this huge um, uh, many body quantum field some very well controlled isolated single photon modes. So these are the three um, uh, general things that I, I, I'd like to give some simple introduction to uh, in this part. Um, so first, before uh, going into that, let me uh, go back away from the electromagnetic field just to the atom. And uh, throughout, I'm going to work with a very simple abstraction of any atom or any qubit, really, where either I'll have some two-level system where the lower energy state uh, labeled by G for ground and the higher energy level one uh, E for excited, or you know maybe some more complex multi-level system. So I'm going to basically totally forget about any internal properties of the atom or the material and, and just assume that I can have direct access to uh, the eigenstates of, of that interaction. So the first thing to uh, try and add on to the simple uh, internal atom picture is the photon bath. So when you think, one way to think about the nature of the electromagnetic field is that it's some uh, typically some thermal distribution of many different modes. Um, so the direct nature of these modes isn't really super important here. It's just some uh, quantum mechanical system with several and with many, many, infinitely many energy eigenstates. And the density matrix for that system is some incoherent superposition uh, over all of those with some probability. So um, for example, the uh, background radiation of the universe is, is in the microwave uh, uh, part of the spectrum. And if you look at how the energy uh, is distributed um, between the lower energy um, modes of the electromagnetic field and the higher energy modes of the electromagnetic field, it forms this very uh, characteristic Planck distribution that peaks around uh, 2.75 Kelvin or 0.23 milli electron volts. So this is kind of the very baseline cold temperature of, of the universe around us, minus anything like the sun or the earth that adds additional uh, uh, heat in, in, into the electromagnetic field. So what happens when you um, add this photon bath onto your simple atomic system? Um, the sort of first most important thing that happens is spontaneous emission. So if you have your quantum system, your atom starting in the excited state, the light matter interaction between the atom and the photon will allow energy to be converted from this internal excited state of the atom into uh, photon energy. Because the bath is uh, so huge that uh, light energy will just immediately be radiated away and the atom no longer has access to it. So this is known as uh, uh, spontaneous emission. So at some rate, your atom will, due to the coupling to the bath, just decay from the E state to the G state. And this rate is typically denoted gamma. Okay, so that's, um, I think, all I want to say about the, the photon bath for now. So um, maybe a little more interesting is what, to, what classical light does. So here, it, it's, uh, again, I'm not really thinking too directly about, you know, the electric or the magnetic idea of the EM field. It's just I have the ability to apply some light that is at a frequency that's resonant with the transition between the um, ground and the excited states of the atom. And if you apply this resonant light to the system, it will drive the, the atom. So you can think of this as adding to your the Hamiltonian that governs the dynamics of the system some just simple drive term. So here you'll notice there's no information about like what the state of the, the light is at all. It's just some external field that I'm adding that causes the system to oscillate at some set frequency omega uh, between the ground and the excited state. So if you track the, say, probability to, of, of the atom to be in the ground or excited state over time, it will you know, just oscillate at this Rabi frequency. So you'll get these 
you know, very characteristic cosine squared and, and sine squared oscillation, oscillations of the probability. All right, now we're going to add back in our, our photon bath ingredient. And we can do something interesting with this. So in addition to having the atom and the drive and the photon bath, I'll also consider a slightly more complicated atom uh, that has two low energy states and one uh, higher energy excited state. So using these three very simple ingredients, you can do something pretty cool called, called optical pumping. So the idea of this is, is the following. You, and it, 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 like, I'm not really saying anything about quantum mechanics at all here, you'll notice. So if I start in this very lowest energy state of the atom, G1, and I apply this optical drive omega. So like before, you know, without talking about the photon bath, it would just oscillate back and forth forever between this G1 and this E, just going back and forth. But because of the photon bath, this E state is not stable. It can radiate away uh, uh, the photon and it has two sort of paths it can decay. One possibility is you pump the atom up from the G state to the E state, and then it decays back down to the G state, G1 state uh, along this path. And you, you basically restart the process. So nothing really uh, interesting has happened. You've just started here, oscillated for a while, and then decayed back down to where you started. Something that's more interesting is if you, is if you uh, oscillate up to the E state and then decay down into the G2 state. So now, because there's no drive that goes between the G2 and the E state, you'll just stay in, in this G2 state um, for a very, very long time. Eventually, you'll decay back down into the G1 state, but usually the rate at which that happens is much, much slower than uh, anything else in your system. Um, I believe uh, in uh, Dan Stamper Kern's CIQC colloquium a, a few months ago, he mentioned that in rubidium, for example, one of these low lying hyperfine levels lives for hundreds of thousands of years right now. <laughs> so it's possible essentially to put to pump all of the probability of what of what state your atom is in into this non-equilibrium state G2. So this is, you know, in, in this case, that's you know, it, it's just some other internal eigenstate of, of, of the atom, but I believe um, Muhammad will tell us maybe some cool ways to use optical pumping to prepare more interesting non-equilibrium states, but this is kind of the essential idea. Okay, um, next up is to move away from kind of ignoring everything about um, uh, what the, the light field is and kind of reduce the complex electromagnetic field down into a very simple quantum system that we can actually uh, understand and just reduce it into a single quantum harmonic oscillator. So the idea of this is basically that we're going that physically you would have two uh, very highly reflective mirrors, and these highly reflective mirrors will apply a, a boundary condition for the electric field, um, and the result of that is that uh, there's only a very few like isolated set of ways that it can oscillate up and down. So that's kind of uh, illustrated here on the right. So it you can have oscillations at this very particular pattern, and you can have either one of those oscillations or two or three. So this just essentially tells you how many photons uh, are in the cavity. This is kind of what um, uh, people mean in, in this context when they talk about, about photons is just a reduce the complex electromagnetic field into a very simple sing single mode system and just how many uh, uh, photons are in that mode. So the, the Hilbert space of this is just some uh, labeled by zero, one, two, all the way up to as many as you'd like. And the energies of each of these modes is just proportional uh, uh, to however many photons are in the cavity. Okay, so this um, on its own is not too interesting. Um, well, there are things that are cool about this. So you can, I, 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 won't, I won't discuss this in any detail, but um, basically anything that you would imagine wanting to do with a simple quantum harmonic oscillator, you can uh, do with this um, photon cavity mode. Um, so yeah, you can look into that if you're interested, but I, I won't dwell on it. So what happens, um, so, you know, I, I said that we've reduced the complex electromagnetic field down to the single mode, but that's not entirely true, right? It's still out there and no cavity is going to be perfect. So this very simple harmonic oscillator mode is also going to be coupled to the great photon bath of the universe and kind of the dominant, um, 
uh, contribution of that is going to be some leakage rate uh, denoted kappa, where uh, at some frequency, if I start with my uh, cavity mode, some state n with n photons in the cavity, one of those will just leak out. It'll it'll exit the cavity and 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 go off into the great beyond, and we'll lose track of that energy. Okay, so yeah, if you it'll just kind of exponentially uh, decay away with some uh, discrete poisson character on top. Now we're going to do um, put our put in our last ingredient, which is uh, the atom. So how so now we have sort of three very simple things: um, the atom with its two internal levels, the cavity mode with its infinite uh, tower of of states, and the photon bath. So the only thing that I haven't told you about um, yet is how the atom and the the photon mode are going to interact. And the way that these interact is, is through the uh, uh, James Cumming Hamiltonian, where if the cavity frequency is matches, is resonant with the energy spacing between the E and the G levels, you can coherently transfer energy between the atom and between the cavity. So what this looks like is kind of written down here. So if I say, um, start with the atom and the excited state and with n photons in the cavity, it can coherently move into have the atom being in the ground state and there being an additional photon in the cavity and back and forth. Okay, so this illustration is, is now starting to get a little overloaded. So let me just simplify it down to, uh, uh, I think the very essential physics, um, which is this um, sort of three level uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian. Okay, and this is basically the last thing I want to talk about. So, you know, I'll, uh, try and slow down here since I think I might have gone a little too fast. So just to reiterate, the most important um, states in the system where I have the atom and I have the cavity mode is the lowest energy state of all is if the atom is in the ground state and there's no photons in the cavity. That's labeled by this G0 state here. Okay. Next up, there's two ways that I can add energy into the system. I can either excite the atom from the G state to the E state like this, but keep no, cav no photon modes in the cavity. So that's this E zero state. Alternatively, I can uh, keep the atom in its ground state and I can add one photon to the cavity. And that's this G one state. So these are the three lowest energy states of the system. Of course, on top of either of these two, I can keep adding more and more and more photons in, but um, you, you know that's, you know, like it, you won't gain any additional very cool physics from that. So let me just focus on these two. So, and uh, yeah, so uh, these are the three levels. And then what is the uh, dynamics of the system look like? So the coherent part of the dynamics is just this James Cummings uh, oscillation between the atom and the ground state and the one and the single photon mode and the atom and the excited state and the, and the zero photon mode. So this is just some coherent term that I uh, wrote on the previous slide just this thing here. And then the modes, and, and then both of these can decay. So this G1 state, the photon can leak out of the cavity at this rate kappa. And then the atom excited state, and if there's no photons in the cavity, the atom can decay with rate gamma. So there's two, I think, interesting limits uh, that people generally think about in this setup. One is the so-called bad cavity limit where the cavity is, is very, very leaky. Um, nevertheless, the atom is still coupled to the cavity mode. So the excited, if you start with an atom and this excited state, it can uh, give its, it can coherently give its energy up to the cavity and enter into this state, uh, but then this will just rapidly decay. So this leads to what's known as the Purcell effect, where when you place an atom in a cavity, the um, Spontaneous emission rate of the atom to decay will increase by this factor that is uh, proportional to g squared over uh, uh, kappa. So um, one application of that is that if you have, say, a spin system and you want all of your spins to be in their lowest energy states, just like the isolated uh, down state of all of the spins, if you put the spins in, in some kind of microwave cavity, you can actually accelerate that process um, so you can more rapidly cool the spins. Um, additionally, uh, in this spontaneous emission process, you emit typically a single photon. So if you're trying to build a single photon source for some kind of quantum information platform, 
then adding a cavity can be a way to potentially enhance the rate at which you can produce these single photons. Um, okay. Maybe more interesting is the strong coupling limit, where this uh, coherent term is like you know, fairly larger than either of these, and it'll actually have coherent oscillations that go back and forth between these for a while. So in this case, the eigenstates of the system are atom photon hybrids, where I'll either have, yeah, they, they just hybridize, so they look like that. And then finally, let me mention um, one application of, of the simple idea, which is how to see a single photon in, in the cavity mode without uh, actually destroying the photon. So if you start with an atom, and, and this is an idea that goes back to the Hirosh group in, in 1999. So this is uh, uh, 20 years ago now. Um, so if I start with an atom in its lower energy state, the G state, and I'll send it through the cavity so it spends some time T in there. If the photon is in the cavity, this hybridization will lead to, I start with the ground state and one photon in the cavity, it'll lead to this uh, final state. Oh, sorry, there's a typo for the no photon term. Uh, this second term should not be there. If there's no photon in the cavity, nothing happens. You just go from the G0 state to the G0 state. Sorry about that. Um, so if I particularly time the speed at which the atom moves through the cavity so that this James Cummings coupling times the time spent in the cavity is uh, uh, equal to pi, then at the end, I will always get G1 to G1 or G2, G0 to G0, but the G1 term will pick up a, a minus one phase and that's measurable. So by doing some interferometry on the, the phase of, of the atom wave function at the end, you can actually measure how many photons are in the cavity without actually affecting how many photons are in the cavity, which is pretty cool. Okay. So I think that that's uh, the end of my introduction pretty much. So um, going back to this, there's uh, in this realm of quantum optics, sort of three ways that you can imagine uh, interfacing light with your system. One is through the system's coupling to the general photon path, which leads to some uh, leakage of energy or preparation of non-equilibrium states. The other is yeah, by this classical drive. And then the last is by isolating a single special photon mode and using this quantum light. Um, I should say that, you know, of course, people have continued to pursue this field since <laughs> this 1999 experiment I mentioned. And some interesting recent developments along these lines are uh, replacing your atom with a solid state system, like a uh, quantum dot or a nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. The whole uh, field of circuit quantum electrodynamics is sort of very closely related to this picture, where the atom is, is now a, 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 a transmon, an artificial uh, a system, and, and instead of having the actual mirror cavity system, it's more like a radio line, but it's still the same sort of spin plus harmonic oscillator picture. Yeah. And of course, yeah. So I think yeah. that's all to say. And let's bring it now into uh, today's talk. So Mohammed will be telling us uh, about what happens when you add quantum light to uh, the many body system. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. So Mohammed, take it away. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. And especially thanks, Marcus, for a very nice intro to the field. Can you see my slide? The right one? Great. Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, now that we learned all the preliminary and basic things that we need for this talk, let's jump to our talk. So um, this doesn't work. So I just want to also, before uh, jumping into the specific talk, introduce what we are doing in my research group, there are basically three main topics that we are working on. One uh, is topological photonics. The idea is how to uh, explore interesting topological effects in uh, photonic systems. And more recently, we have realized that we can actually use these robust systems to make maybe useful uh, uh, structures uh, like frequency comb and uh, photon pair generation uh, on chip. Uh, Bubakar is an expert in this topic, so I hope uh, he will uh, bring also some other speakers to talk about that. And there is another topic which is actually very related to uh, QLCI uh, that you have, 
which is the idea of quantum uh, simulators, how we can efficiently measure the system, how we can efficiently uh, implement certain Hamiltonians and interesting models, etc. In particular, we had some results on how to uh, uh, engineer synthetic topologies uh, after uh, after the system is done, basically in post processing. You, I give you a wave function, for example, on a disk. Uh, can I post process it in such a way that as if the wave function was living on a torus or with something that has a handle? And can we use this to measure uh, many body properties like fractional churn number, et cetera, where we don't have access to put the system on a torus or put this, to put the system on cylinder. Most of the platforms, as you know, they, they work on a, a, a flat surface. And then how we can measure the bath efficiently, et cetera. So if you're interested in these topics, uh, please ask questions uh, later uh, after the talk and we can chat about it. The subject of this talk is quantum optics of correlated uh, electrons. And uh, uh, thanks to Marcus, now we know what are some of the tool, uh, uh, some of the tools in the toolbox of quantum optics. Uh, so the whole idea is that, uh, um, can we use this uh, quantum optical toolbox on correlated electron system? The opposite of this has been going on for a long time, in particular in the context of uh, cold atom systems that we had these interesting Hamiltonian models like bose hubbard model, uh, vortex states, fractional quantum Hall states, et cetera, how we can implement it in an AMO system using quantum optical toolbox. Now, this is the other way around that we want to uh, use quantum optical toolbox on correlated uh, electronic system. And in particular, can we use these techniques, both theoretical and experimental, to create and control many body states of uh, uh, electron. So I mean theoretical because um, uh, we, like 40 years ago, we didn't really know how to treat the bath, how we can manipulate single electron and, and single photon and, and single excitations. So the whole message that I would like to give during this talk is that all the things that we learn, how to manipulate single photons, single electrons, single phonons, can we apply these to now many body uh, correlated state of electrons? And this is already an ongoing work. It's not that we just came up uh, with this idea last night. Uh, there are uh, many works that can fit in this category. For example, uh, the works that Norm and company has been doing on many body localization, time crystal is actually an example of this. Fluke topological insulator that I start with an insulated system that is not insulating, I shine light and then couple some of the levels and then turn it into a, a, a topological insulator. The more recent experiments on light induced or light enhanced superconductivity, and these are some, uh, some figures from uh, uh, Andrea Cavalieri's group, where uh, you shine light and uh, you are, it seems that we are actually inducing superconductivity with just light. Cavity enhanced uh, uh, um, transport. If you have a bunch of, if you have an, uh, some uh, complicated molecule, you, you don't have any transport or your transport is very limited, but now you put it, you put the cavity around it. Can we enhance the transport? And there was some recent experiment in Thomas, Thomas Everson's lab uh, and a fractional quantum Hall state in optical cavity. Instead of putting the two-level system that Marcus was talking about. Now, if you put a fraction of quantum Hall state, a correlated state of electrons in a cavity, what can we do with it and what can we learn from it? So now going uh, from uh, correlated electrons to atomic, uh, to, to AMO was with atomic precision. We could implement bose howard model with atomic precision. Going this way, it's basically grain of salt precision because you have now to deal with a correlated uh, uh, matter. You have to deal with a real electronic system with disorder, with a, the with a complicated band structure, et cetera, et cetera. So these uh, stories are gonna be way more complicated and experiment and theories should really come from one side to the other. And then maybe hopefully at some point they meet each other. So since this is a colloquium, I want to give like a, a broad uh, spect uh, the, the broad view of where this uh, fits in the uh, in the quantum optics language, and thanks to Marcus, we are already halfway through that. So, um, 
uh, I was inspired actually by this review that uh, uh, Derek Chang, uh, uh, Misha Lukin, and Vlad and Volicic wrote a while ago on, on how to see quantum optics in different regimes. One axis is photon number. The other axis is interaction strength per photons. So uh, this in the free space would be basically a fine structure factor, how strongly light can interact with the, with the two-level system. So if, you, if you're in free space and you have a small number of photons, then you're in the linear optics regime. If you, if you increase the number of photons while keeping the strength of interaction small, then you go to classical nonlinear optics, like solitons, things like that. Now, if you put the photon in a cavity such that this photon can talk to the atom many times before it leaves the cavity, then you increase that uh, probability of interacting with a single atom by the number of round trips, uh, people usually call it finesse, and you go to the regime of cavity QED that we just heard about. Now, if you put many photons in that system, then we can talk about many photons that are strongly interacting with each other. And the most recent example was uh, creation of a moth insulator of photons uh, in, in Chicago. So the way that to do it is that you put the atom in the cavity and, and the only shape that I could find was a duck uh, in my keynote, and I think Marcus was <laughs> was inspired by this, or the other way around, that he used the duck uh, as the as the preferred uh, way of uh, showing uh, an arbitrary mode of light. So now, the idea here is that then we have yet another axis that might have been overlooked, and that's the uh, correlation between electrons. So if the uh, electrons are local, say. Uh, it's in, in a quantum dot or, a, or a, 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 in V centers or any color centers in diamond, then the electronic correlation length or or uh, local uh, and and weak. There is no uh, correlation. It's just a two level uh, system like a hydrogen atom. But then when we can go to the regime that electrons are strongly correlated, strongly interacting with each other, we can have Martin insulators, fractional quantum hollow states of electrons, etc. What happens when light interact? With these material, and then, and then we can tile uh, uh, this three-dimensional system uh, by different examples. Of course, it's it's hard to show different examples in three D. Uh, so, in this uh, perspective, that uh, hopefully will come out soon. We we try to uh, look at different regimes. For example, if I have a classical light and uh, no correlation or weak correlation in, uh, correlation in the system, let's say graphene, and I shine strong light, then I get fluke topology insulator. So this is one way of classically changing the Hamiltonian of the system. Now, if we go uh, to a correlated system, then we can think of uh, uh, changing the superconducting uh, uh, behavior in the system. So again, the number of photons is large, the correlation is now large, and we are in this regime. Or we can go to another regime that we have correlated electronic states. They are strongly interacting with each other and like a fraction of quantum Hollis state and then put, the, put them in a cavity and study them. If they're weakly interacting with each other, then that would be the story of exciton polariton, say in, in the gallium arsenide system. So this, this, these kind of uh, regimes are, are the interest uh, uh, of, of, is of our interest in, uh, so basically using light to manipulate uh, the band structure or uh, the interaction in the system, and also look uh, using these cavity QED tools uh, to manipulate and control the state of the system. So with this very broad uh, overview, I would like to uh, kind of give, a, give an outlook here, and then we'll come back to this outlook again, what kind of questions we are answering uh, over here. So the regimes of considerations are the following, is that how strong the, uh, the drive should be? Should be? Should it be a, a, a vacuum or a classical states, etc., uh, compared to the energy of the system? What's the form of the drive? As uh, a coherent state, a thermal state, or a squeezed states, would it matter? Can we actually use the uh, statistical statistics of light to uh, achieve uh, what we are looking for? Can we, for example, induce some pairing uh, using uh, a pairing of photons using uh, squeezed photons? A special form of the coupling. Uh, we can actually shine light in many pattern, uh, as we've learned uh, in particular in cold atom and Rydberg arrays. Can we use them for uh, electronic systems as well? 
Uh, in many of the situations here, we are dealing with itinerant electrons that the electron can actually move around the system rather than being localized in, in, uh, uh, in color centers. So then uh, can we use a dipole approximation and whether just some of the basic things that we know in quantum optics apply or not? So one of the questions that again, the, what the light coherent play a role or simply a co incoherent pump is enough breakdown of two-level two uh, 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 two atom picture. What is a strong uh, uh, light matter uh, coupling limit? Uh, we heard in the pre-talk that there is a very nice uh, uh, model. It's called James Cummings model, and it kind of captures most of the uh, uh, quantum optics that we know. We have a two-level system and a cavity, and then this is actually very nice. It captures many of the physics. We unfortunately don't yet have such a thing for correlated electrons, in particular because they are moving around. What's, what do we mean by strong light matter coupling? Uh, it was mentioned ultra strong coupling uh, in the pre-talk. Sometimes actually this ultra strong coupling uh, regime is classical and uh, don't get to it into the talk, but then we can uh, talk about it, why uh, sometimes it's actually classical regime. Floquet band engineering. I have light that uh, can engineer the band, uh, change the band structure of the system. Basically the, the Robbie coupling that uh, we had in the pre-talk couples two level system. But now imagine that I do it for an ensemble of uh, two level systems that are in the momentum space. So basically I start with the, some band structure in the brilliant zone, I couple light and I can change the band structure. Also, we can use this light coupling to change the effective interaction in the system. We always have Coulomb interaction in an electronic system. Can I use light to actually pick up specific part of the Coulomb interaction? and tailor uh, the form uh, or strength of my Coulomb interaction. Uh, how does the drive compete with the formation of excellence? This is a little bit technical. Most of the theories that has been developed, they are for free electron uh, or correlated electron system. And they do not really take into account that one, once we shine light, we actually, the first thing that we create might be an exciton. Like in a, in a semiconductor, for example, uh, the, the, if you use just a free uh, carrier uh, picture, and then you get everything wrong. You don't uh, get the absorption lines, et cetera. You have to consider the Coulomb interaction and in particular, the formation of excitons. Uh, one uh, kind of very important uh, um, uh, consideration is the, the situation of heating and disorder. Once we shine light on a system, we may just heat it and do not see anything. But fortunately, some recent experiments have shown us that uh, this is actually possible. We can have a coherent light matter interaction in a material like BEC in gallium or Floquet physics in graphene. That um, shining light does not lead to heating and we can have some coherent uh, physics. So these are kind of the, the questions that I would like to talk about in the talk. Mm, the specific uh, problems uh, are in two categories. The first category is uh, superconductors, how we can use some of these techniques like uh, cavity QED, uh, optical pumping, squeezed light, and, and selective coupling to uh, play with the properties of the semiconductor, maybe enhance them or maybe induce them. And then second part is more how we can use patterned light or, or cavities uh, to change uh, and uh, study some of the topological properties of the electronic states. So, and then I don't know what the exact format is. Please jump in and ask questions uh, as they come in. Sounds good? Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, if you would prefer to have your question asked anonymously, you can feel free to pass it along to me in the chat and I will send it along to Mohammed. So. That's also an option. Uh, or if you prefer to just put it in the chat uh, in, in, in public, I will also uh, call it out and, and read it as soon as I can. So yeah, feel free to ask questions in the chat either publicly or privately. Yes, I would uh, really appreciate it because then I know how uh, fast or how slow I'm going. So let's start with the first example uh, of a superconductor in a cavity. Okay, so you put the cavity in a microwave oven. And what's gonna happen to it? Uh, the naive uh, 
uh, guess is that, okay, uh, it's gonna kill the superconductivity, but uh, it turned out that it's not the case. And then there's a theory and experiment from a long time ago that actually uh, this, uh, and this, is, uh, this is not always the case. We can actually enhance superconductivity by shining light. And uh, the, the sim very simple picture to understand it is the following. Uh, you have uh, the Cooper pairs, and then you have the superconducting gap, and then the, you have the Bogolyubov of quasi particles on top. If you shine some light with some frequency, this, in this case with the microwave, less than this gap, then you cannot break, break any Cooper pair because you don't have the required energy. Each photon doesn't have the required energy to break this Cooper pair. So instead, you're not going to touch touch these guys. Instead, you're going to uh, excite these Bogolyubov of quasi particles that are close to the gap and then promote them or kind of evaporate them to higher energies. And the way that the BCS uh, theory and the gap equation works is that you really care about these guys that are close to the gap. So if you put them away, then uh, you effectively increase your gap by getting rid of them and then putting them at high, higher energy and hopefully they get, get stuck and don't come back immediately. And that's how people kind of understand it in hand maybe maybe why, why uh, you can actually enhance it. And then there are also recent uh, experimental groups in, in uh, Cavalier's group that we can actually enhance it. So we asked the question, can we use uh, the cavity QED tools to uh, enhance superconductivity, not just shine classical light, but if I just couple it to a cavity and enhance it. So the idea is very simple. I have this bowl of quasi particle that are thermally uh, um, occupied, because uh, usually my, uh, my system is sit in a phonon bath at some temperature. But now if I couple the system, let's say very cartoon, I have a superconductor and I put it in the cavity to a bunch of photons that their frequency is held at some, uh, at their temperature is held at some temperature T cavity. So I have coupling to the photons and I come into the photons. And this auxiliary bath can cool uh, the superconductor to a lower temperature than this uh, T of the uh, temperature of the phonon. Then in principle, I should be able to increase uh, this um, this gap. So that's a, that's a very uh, high level uh, way of understanding it. A little bit more technical, it would be that I have a gap equation that comes from the BCS theory. This is uh, the strength of the, 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 the coupling. This is the, uh, this, uh, the occupation of the Bogolyubov of quasi-particle, and this is the gap. So by basically reducing the number of Bogolyubov of quasi-particle by, by uh, um, cooling them, then uh, we effectively uh, increase the gap. I have to solve this equation for, for delta. So by lowering this, I can uh, in increase this. So this was a collaboration uh, with uh, my colleague, Victor Galitsky, and these uh, gentlemen who none of them are at JQI anymore. They're all graduated and left. So how can I understand it a little bit more uh, systematically is that I have to write the light matter interaction. So this is a little bit technical, but I will, I will zoom out again. Uh, don't worry if you don't follow all the details is that there is a current, there is the A modes. In the pre-talk, we just we were dealing with, we were dealing with one uh, cavity mode. Now we are uh, dealing with many cavity modes. So I write it in terms of uh, electronic uh, uh, creation and destruction operator but I'm dealing with a superconductor, so I have to rotate it and then use this uh, uh, Bogolyubov quasi-particle after the Bogolyubov transformation. And then once you basically write the different terms that, uh, that come out, I have uh, six, six terms. One of them is the uh, destruction of a photon uh, and then creation of two uh, quasi-particle or scattering one, et cetera. And then some of them are just non-resonant because this is destruction of a photon and then destroying two quasi particles as well. So these are non-resonant. So these two uh, are non-resonant, we can neglect them. And the other four, uh, we, need, uh, we take them into account. And then we just use Fermi golden rule and rate equation to find now what's the new distribution of uh, the Bogolyubov of quasi particles. So, uh, one of them is that I emit a photon and I lower the energy of the Bogolyubov of quasi-particle. The other one is that I absorb a photon and I increase 
the energy of the Boisot quasi particle. This is similar to the Eli Eichberg effect that the photon is absorbed and I go to higher energy. I can also emit a photon and then form a con form a pair, and this is good because I'm creating more pairs. Or the other way around, I'm heating the system. I, I'm destroying uh, one of these uh, Gruber pairs and creating. Uh, to uh, quasi particles. So these are all the form terms that I had in the previous slide. And now, if I put everything together, calculate the uh, the new distribution uh, of the Gouri of quasi particle, and then uh, solve for my uh, gap and look at the gap enhancement as a function of the frequency of uh, the cavity, we see such a thing. In particular, if the cavity is uh, is cool, is colder than the than the temperature of your phonon, then you see an enhancement uh, of these guys. I have to say these are competing with each other. So red is good, green is good, but then blue and purple are bad. So one has to just solve it and then see what's going on. Uh, if the temperature of the photons are higher than the temperature of the phonons, then you, we don't see any enhancement. We see suppression. However, if the frequency of the photons that are very hot is lower than the, uh, uh, the gap uh, of the superconductor, then you enhance it. And that's basically the Eli-Ashberg effect because remember that the photon was below the gap, it would enhance it. But here, I'm just thermally doing that. So in the, that theory of Eli-Ashberg that we were dealing with coherent uh, photons, the coherence actually did not really matter. The number of photons uh, mattered over there. So uh, what we have here is that coherence of the, uh, the photon does not play a role. And uh, we didn't really require a strong uh, light matter coupling. I have to say this is strong uh, uh, still, since we don't have is this two level uh, picture and the James Cummings Hamiltonian, the word of strong coupling, weak coupling uh, should be taken with a grain of salt. And, uh, and we are still trying to understand what the strong coupling mean in this alternate electronic system. So now, so there's hey, a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mohammed. So in, in this plot, there's an interesting point where all of these temperature curves uh, intersect at like omega over delta of like 2.5. Three or so. Is that a wisdom? Uh, is that is that physics or is, is that just some artifact? Um, I think it's artifact because once you do it for a multi mode, then things can can change. Okay. So now now that we have this, and we I, I said that the coherence of the photon does not matter. And now let's look at some other kinds of uh, photons, the squeeze the state. That's, the, that's another uh, type that we all know and, and like. And, um, and let's uh, just uh, assume like a vacuum squeezed state. Uh, let's put the itinerant electron on the side. Let's consider a bunch of spins, two level systems that are coupled to a cavity. So this is the energy of the cavity. This is the energy of the spins. And I have the coupling of the spins to the cavity. Now, if you look at this term, this is one quadrature of the photon. This is the x quadrature. I'm coupling to the x quadrature and not the p quadrature. So if I uh, somehow squeeze this x quadrature, then I can effectively increase this coupling uh, g. So that's basically the idea of uh, squeezing the light in the cavity to enhance um, the G in the James Cummings model. But one has to be careful because uh, squeezing is always defined with respect to a local oscillator. So what do we mean here? And, and, and that's some in some literature, uh, it was actually uh, ignored. So this is the cohere, this is the parametric drive that we need to, uh, to squeeze this quadrature. So this is like the squeezing operator is A squared plus A dagger squared. If you apply this operator, it squeezes one quadrature versus the other quadrature and enhance the fluctuations uh, of one quadrature versus the other. So now let's go back to the caveat that I said. If I now write the effective interaction, uh, so I integrate out the photonic degree of freedom and I look at what spin-spin uh, interaction I can mediate, you see that this is the detuning, this is the amount of uh, uh, squeezing that I have in the system. I'm enhancing the uh, coupling for one uh, type of interaction and then decreasing the interaction for the other one. Uh, that, that's going to make sense. Now, if I cho chose a different uh, quadrature, 
then I would do the same. So it's actually a phase sensitive way to enhance the uh, interaction and one has to be careful with that. Okay, so now with this introduction, we can go and look at the itinerant electron system and then look at uh, uh, um, B, uh, superconductivity. And uh, there was some work recently that uh, experimental work and followed by some theoretical work that phonon squeezing actually may play, play a role in, uh, in this three and superconductors. Then the question that we ask is that, can we inject the squeezing by hand? So I have some light that has some squeezing. Can I inject that, turn that squeezing into uh, a phonon squeezing? So that, that's one option. So I use optomechanics to transfer the squeezing of photons into phonons. And let's say I put the superconductor in a cavity with some uh, uh, parametric drive. So this will lead to squeezing of my uh, cavity mode. And then that squeezing, because of I have optomechanical coupling, it will translate into a squeeze of a phonon and eventually that should enhance my superconductivity. The second option is that I squeeze the phonons directly through modulated drive. So this is my superconductor that forms also a mirror and uh, a mirror of the cavity by time modulating the drive, then you can squeeze its phonon and uh, we may actually enhance the superconductivity. So the Hamiltonian describing these, uh, these two systems is the same. You have a bunch of uh, phonons and then uh, you have a bunch of photons. Uh, the photons are driven from outside as time modulated. This, uh, this is the time modulation of the drive and this is the strength of the drive. And then you have some optomechanical coupling, which is basically the, the position of the mirror times uh, the uh, frequency of the cavity. Once I move, I change the frequency of the cavity. There is a, there is a question. Yeah, so I think I didn't uh, cover this in my introduction, the notion of uh, photon quadratures or uh, squeezed states of light. So could you just give like a few uh, brief remarks to, to give some intuition on uh, what like this squeeze state is and then why it might be interesting? Uh -huh, sure. Uh, so, um, so by uh, a, sing, uh, a cavity mode, a single mode is described by a harmonic oscillator. So harmonic oscillator in a classical picture, we know that it has X and P and it, it oscillates as a function of time. Now, uh, this is the classical picture. The quantum picture is, is the same. You have the X and P quadrature and in X and P it, it oscillates as a function of time. So that is the quantum version of it is basically a coherent state. The coherent state is that classical blob that is going around in the phase space. Now, if we consider the vacuum state, it would be the same blob, but at the center. And it is always Heisenberg limited. We have uh, this uncertainty in X and P. But squeezing means that you can actually uh, play with this uncertainty in one direction versus the other. Or you can squeeze it in one direction, but it should go in the opposite direction such that Heisenberg uncertainty is satisfied. And you can squeeze it in the X direction or you can squeeze it in the P direction. So what I was saying in the previous slide is that it really matters what quadrature we are squeezing. And uh, uh, I hope that that brief uh, uh, um, introduction to squeezing was enough. And these papers, uh, they made use of the, they made the use of the fact that the Hamiltonian had some specific form so you would actually enhance the quadrature uh, automatically that you want. But if you want to do it optically, then we really have to be careful with what phase we are coming into the system uh, with respect to the local oscillator. And, uh, and then uh, that would determine whether we are enhancing or inhibiting uh, superconductivity. Great, thank you so much. So now uh, I can have the, the, this, uh, Tc, the, 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 the critical temperature, as a function of these two parameters. One is the, uh, the classical drive, and the other one is the amount of squeezing. If you squeeze too much, then the system can go unstable. Um, but if you squeeze a little bit, then you can actually enhance uh, Tc. So what these works were uh, before was just they were looking at the zero squeezing from outside and then uh, doing this classical drive. Now we just added this, uh, this access to it that um, we're using this squeezing, we can even further enhance it. So now this, this concludes the squeezing part. 
Now, uh, what if we just go a little bit uh, step backward and then uh, just use a classical drive uh, as a way to optically pump the system in a, in a regime that we want? And this is, uh, this is the work that was led by Hossein uh, Dehani, uh, my, my, my postdoc in collaboration with Victor and then uh, former graduate student, Zach. So the idea uh, is that in, super, in many superconductors, they have, you have competing order parameters. One is superconductivity, the other one is charge density wave or bond density waves. So, uh, and then suppression of one would lead to the enhancement of the, the other one. So the idea we had was the following is that if these uh, charge density phases have some excitations that we can excite optically, and we send them somewhere like uh, Eli Ashberg effect, and hopefully they will settle in some steady state and don't bother us uh, immediately, then we can enhance the superconductivity. So one uh, issue here is that uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, this bond density wave, they have some dispersion and the dispersion is dictated by the electronic degrees of freedom. And the simplest model that you can write, it has a Fermi velocity in it. So that the Fermi velocity will just come as the dispersion of those collective modes. So now if I want to couple something which has, which has a dispersion of a Fermi velocity, then I have to shrink the wave, wavelength of my light such that I can resonantly couple to it. So the energy momentum um, uh, matching here requires me to really shrink the wavelength of light. And for that, we came up with this idea to use a surface uh, plasma polarity. So we, uh, you come with light from, uh, from free space, that surface plasma polariton are a way to shrink the wavelength of light for this, for this same frequency. You don't change the frequency, you just change the wavelength. And then uh, using that uh, match, that uh, dispersion, and then evaporate it. So that, that's kind of a theoretical proposal uh, that we have put forward and might, might be interesting to pursue. So uh, most of the things, everything I'm actually talking today is all theoretical and, and, uh, and proposals that, that we are working on. Uh, so uh, now we can take one step even further, not, not look at light enhanced superconductivity, look at light induced superconductivity with light. Wait, 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 like, like, I'm being redundant here. <laughs> um, so this is an old story. Uh, of course, this goes back to many, many decades ago that I have a semiconductor, can you shine light and then make me a superconductor? So the idea is, is kind of simple. If you go back to the BCS theory, you have this Cooper pair, you have two electrons with two opposite momenta uh, and uh, different uh, spins, and I can pair them. And I write this gap equation, similar to the gap equation that I wrote, wrote in the beginning. Here is the linearized version of it basically tells me that whenever uh, I have a situation like this and I have a non-zero G, then I have non-zero pairing. The critical point in this equation is that I have to have this negative sign over here, meaning that I need to have attraction, which in the BC theory is coming from phonon, um, to uh, get, get a non-zero pairing. Because if these Bogolev of quasi-particles uh, of these, or these original electrons are thermally occupied, then always the sign of this is positive. So I need a negative sign such that this, this works out. But now uh, here, uh, uh, if I consider now the electrons are from two different valleys or from two different flavors, one is K, one is minus K, but one is coming from the valence band. The other one is coming from the conduction band or from like two different flavors. And if I can prepare the, the distribution of uh, these electrons in one uh, of this flavor and the other flavor independent of each other, such that they can play with the overall sign of this expression, then I can have superconductivity with even attractive, with even repulsive interaction to start. So that's the key idea. Now, uh, so now how, how is it possible? Uh, the way to do it uh, is to have these two flavors to be optically uh, uh, to, to, to be able to optically select uh, these, these, these two flavors. And that has been shown in uh, many systems, including uh, transition metal, that you have two valleys, 
then uh, the, depending on the polarization of your light, you can talk to one value versus the other one. In particular, you have a K and K prime minus K or K value. One, as, uh, one polarization, circular polarized, right circular polarized talks uh, to one value, and then sigma minus talks to the other value, the majority of it. At the center of the band, uh, you have 100%, but when you deviate, it changes. But that, to a large extent, you can assume that if you're shining sigma plus light, it will couple to one valley and not to the other valley. So now I have prepared these uh, uh, states, uh, these, these populations, kind of in an independent way. I talk to these guys and maybe do half half here, and then zero one uh, over here. So by coupling this, now this will be the, my new bands. So depending on the frequency of your light, you will. Uh, couple this band in the rotating frame. This, this band will come to this, and, and then this band will come to this. In one of them, you have some coupling, like the Robbie uh, that we had in the pre-talk. This Robbie frequency is non-zero, so you open up a, uh, uh, you have a crossing over here. In the other one, you don't, because this is very, very uh, small. So if I plot the density, the, the population as a function of momentum, then in one valley is different than the other one. Now I can consider the pairing across the valley, when electrons with different momenta that are coupled to each other and electrons that are coupled uh, to each other. And uh, indeed, in some regimes, I can have the to be positive or to be negative, that population uh, term that I had in the previous slide. Now, what about the uh, interaction? Now we have, we have Coulomb interaction. Uh, the interesting part is that uh, the, the frequency of the light will determine where this crossing is happening. So this is the crossing and this is the frequency of the light. It can be, it can cross at this point or it can cross at this point. So the, now the, the electrons that are important are, are these electrons. By, by, so by choosing the frequency of the light, then the momentum classes I need to consider to put back into my equation to get the non-zero pairing are coming from here or maybe coming from here if my light was coupled at a lower frequency. So depending on the frequency of the light, I can look at uh, different forms of uh, uh, different parts of Coulomb interaction that enter my equation. In particular, I have to write my uh, Coulomb interaction in this band. I have to project it in this band and then look at different, uh, different channels that is like S wave or a P wave or a D wave. Just, I'm not going into the details of it. Uh, just the, the fact that, the, the, the frequency of my light would determine which momentum class is, is relevant. And then that frequency will tell me uh, which mode is more favorable. So this is the critical, uh, uh, critical uh, coupling as a function of frequency. You see that here it has a lower uh, value and then here the uh, S wave has a lower value. P here has a P wave has a, has a lower value. So what we did in this, uh, in this work is that not only we used light to selectively uh, have this population, but also the frequency of the light can determine what form of interaction becomes more relevant. So it's a way to uh, change the interaction and, and then use this interaction engineering. Have another example of it uh, using uh, in the fractional quantum Hall uh, case in, in graphene. And then there are also some other works from other groups, how we can use this drive to have different forms of um, interaction. So Marcus, how much time do I have? Because I, I, it's a non-conventional. Right, so I think I passed it over to you at 12.33 or so. So I think you have about 20 minutes left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, so that's the, that's the first uh, part uh, that um, uh, we, we looked at various ways of uh, playing with light matter interaction to um, to enhance or to induce uh, superconductivity. In the second part, uh, uh, we will explore like topological states of electronic systems, how we can use light to make some of them or to uh, measure some of them. So this requires a little bit of a, a background in, uh, in quantum hall. So I will uh, very briefly go over it. So most of the probes in, in, in quantum hall, uh, the electronic ones are in two form. One of them is transport, and it's global. You look at the conductance uh, and uh, you can 
have global properties of the system, but it's not local. You don't know what's happening inside your sample. There are also uh, local uh, measurements like uh, STM and SET, but they are local, uh, but they're in incoherent. You cannot, for example, image the wave function uh, of that in, in generally. So the idea is that can these optical techniques be like a complementary way to uh, uh, to measure them in the first in the first step, and then later to to manipulate them. Uh, so, in a, when we have a, a, a quadratically dispersive electronic system, we have a, like a p squared for the dispersion of the electron. When you apply uh, some electromagnetic field, in, in this case a static uh, magnetic field, then you do minimal coupling. You have you have something uh, like like this. Now, uh, you can define uh, these uh, um, generalized momentum as P, uh, as P plus EA and, uh, in X and, X, X and Y direction. And you immediately see that when you look at the commutation relation of this pi X and pi Y, if the magnetic field is uniform, then they satisfy the commutation relation of a of a, a harmonic oscillator, so the, uh, 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 like an X and P of a harmonic oscillator. So then we can actually define the ladder operators, etc., and then write your Hamiltonian as a harmonic oscillator. So this is actually what leads to Landau levels. So if you have two-dimensional electron gas and you put a magnetic field, you know that you get this equally spaced Landau levels. A very quick way to understand it is actually to do this uh, two-line math. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, hi, hi, Mohammed. Sorry, yeah. uh, I, I misspoke. The organizers reminded me that we want to leave plenty of time uh, for discussion at the end. So, could we do instead of twenty minutes? Could you do ten minutes? Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so then, I don't know. Then so I, say ten minutes. So uh, starting. Really <laughs> okay, good. No, no, I, I, I keep the same speed. It doesn't matter. I don't have to finish all the slides. So the key here is that if you start with graphene that is linear dispersive, then your form of coupling is different. Uh, you, have, uh, you have this uh, uh, pseudo-spin structure, uh, and then you end up with this hemi, uh, you do the same, uh, you do the same uh, uh, replacement, uh, and then you have to square this such that you get your harmonic oscillator. That's why instead of now having equidistant uh, Landau levels, you get the Landau levels that uh, go at the square root of n. So as a function of magnetic field, the Landau levels are not linear function of magnetic field, but they bend like this. Why this is important? Because it allows us to selectively uh, uncouple to them. If, if it was a linear uh, situation, then you could not selectively couple to one Landau level two and uh, to this one, with this Landau transitions. And this was actually experimentally observed that you can see this Landau level transitions in transmission. So this is transmission as a function of photon energy, and these dips correspond to different Landau level transitions. So in principle, one can look at uh, these Landau level transitions and then resolve them as a function of space. So imagine that you have, this is energy, this is um, uh, the index of your Landau orbits. You have many of these Landau uh, orbits. You excite them, and then you look at the photoluminescence, let's say. And then by monitoring that, uh, this is a simulation done by Michael Collins, is that if you have such, such disorder in the system and if you resolve it, then you can reconstruct the, 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 uh, um, the, uh, the disorder map. Now, oops. Uh, I, I jump over this. Now, uh, what if I put my family level inside the, the valence band, not in the middle of the gap, like inside the valence band. Then I can actually excite a photon over here. The photon can come back and recombine with the, uh, sorry, electron can come back and recombine with the hole, but it can also go to the other states. In principle, they are allowed. It, can it actually happen? And we know that these states can be actually very large in principle. So you have some edge states that are very large in the system. And uh, is, does it uh, become a problem at some point? In most cases in quantum optics, the electronic wave function is much um, smaller than the wavelength of light. So you do dipole approximation and everything is fine. But if the electronic wave function is large, then you have higher order transitions, the transitions that are not usually allowed. So you usually have the S to P transition but S2D transitions are allowed. Uh, it's just they're very, very weak 
and experimental actually they have been observed, uh, but they're just weak. So now in this quantum Hall systems they're very large, so there should be some manifestation of it. A very easy way to see them is to just look at the Fermi Golden Rule. You have some initial state and final state and your interaction in between. So these are concentric orbits coming from the Landau uh, levels and in, the, in the complex plane. The, R is, is the radial position and theta is the angular uh, degree of freedom and M is some integer. The same for the excited state, they're just the same. And then uh, the A can be described by some Bessel function or Lager Gaussian field that has the right uh, symmetry. You see that you have immediately a dipole selection, this is, sorry, uh, transition selection rule that M uh, over here can absorb a non zero orbital angular momentum and then go to another M, which is uh, uh, M prime, should be M plus L. And usually this L, if it's non-zero, if it's, uh, sorry, if it's, uh, if it's one or two or three, th this expression becomes very, very small because the radial overlap is very, very small. But it turned out that once we calculate this, and look at the branching ratio as a function of this multipole, this, this orbital angular momentum of light, then it go kind of stays flat. And then at some point it decreases. So in a usual case, when you have your sample much smaller than the wavelength of light, you only get the L0 term, but then, uh, and then it immediately goes down if your sample size is, is comparable to the wavelength of light. But if your sample size is larger than the wavelength of light, then you can actually have this non-zero uh, orbital angular momentum transition and you should deviate from dipole approximation. And this should be seen uh, in, an, uh, in an experimental uh, setting. Uh, so that uh, more carefully we have looked into the system uh, whether this one can actually do a photocurrent measurement by basically uh, uh, shining an orbital angular momentum of light to a, a, to a sample and then look at the radial current that it's produced in the absence of any bias because photons impart, are imparting their orbital angular momentum and then increasing the size, the radius uh, of the electronic wave function. So this would be like a very macroscopic uh, manifestation of uh, how we can deviate from the pile approximation and then our understanding of light matter coupling is, is not as, uh, as we thought. Another one that we was confusing was that the, the, the uh, observed photocurrent as a function of the power should not be just our unusual pump, optical pumping rule, which, is, which scales with the square of the Rabi frequency. It squares actually, it, it scales with four, um, uh, four over three. And, and we understand why this is. And so uh, hopefully there will be an experimental verification of this uh, and, uh, and an even more general approach to measure this. Uh, uh, maybe this could be kind of generalized it's an optical way to measure and control the spatial electronic coherence. This is, so far, there is not even an interaction in the system. I, I was interested, and we were like really interested in starting looking at this interaction, but we understand even the light matter interaction, the single uh, uh, photon and the single electron level uh, is, is already very interesting. So uh, just briefly talk about this. There, are, there has been a lot of interest in Moiré systems that you have a lattice and you have super lattice on it uh, that are passively made. Uh, we were wondering whether light can actually uh, create them because some of these super lattices are large, like 10 nanometer, 50 nanometer, maybe even 100 nanometer. And even optical field can be something like a 200 nanometer is not crazy. This is still... Um, um, sub wavelength uh, limited, but 200 nanometer is not crazy. And we were thinking how we can use pattern light to change the uh, underlying Hamiltonian of the system uh, and, uh, and then look at different properties. We're basically having like a square lattice, changing the intensity of light going to a um, topological insulator or not topological insulator, depending on the intensity of the light or making uh, making a tilted lattice or a Kagome lattice, etc. Basically, was inspired by uh, this uh, experiments that uh, uh, people have been doing on, on Rydberg and cold atom using uh, special light modulator or any kind of light patterning. Can we 
uh, import them to to electronic systems and 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 make them happy. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention uh, and summarize. This is some bunch of the um, references that we have been working on, and then uh, we can we can chat about uh, like. The future and I was given a, a list of things that I have to think about the near near term goal and the future goals etc and I have some slides on that and we can chat afterwards. thank you all right thank you very much Mohammed that was a wonderful talk um, do we have uh, uh, questions from the audience So, Mohamed, can you maybe come back on uh, the, I'm not sure I understood the platform on which you were uh, changing the photo current with the OEM. Uh, do you mind coming back to that uh, system? So what, what was the platform? Graphene. Okay, I see. So, a graphene under quantum hall. Uh, so, if you have actually quantum hall uh, state, and we have some experimental result um, that the idea is kind of that you have uh, like a piece of graphene and you shine light. I don't mm -hmm. know whether you can see it. Uh, maybe I can do it here. So uh, you have graphene and you shine light uh, in the quantum Hall regime, depending on which part you're actually shining light, the, the current can go in one direction versus the other. Yeah, it, this, this is polar polarity. So that, that was kind of understood. And we kind of did that experiment to, to uh, warm up as a kind of as a warm up. But then uh, the idea would be do it with. And what is the value of uh, B uh, in the experiment? It can go from zero to uh, twelve Tesla. Yeah, bigger is better, um, but uh, but that's so. This one will be similar, but in a Corvino geometry, such that the whole point is that the electron should appreciate the orbital angular momentum of light. So. Um, you, you're you're an expert of orbital angular momentum. So like I I have this zero. Uh, um, so if if my electronic wave function winds around this orbital angular momentum, is this uh, light with OAM? I can actually uh, appreciate its its vortex. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if I have an OAM uh, like a Lagrange like Gaussian field like this, and my electronic wave function is circulating on the tip of this, mm -hmm. it should not care about the orbital angular momentum. Orbital angular momentum is um, is origin dependent, it's not, not like momentum. So it really matters that the whole of the orbital angular momentum and whole of the electronic wave function coincide. And one just way to do it is to do the Corbino. Um, so we have one question in the chat, which is from uh, Monique Nam. Um, and the question is, uh, has there been uh, experimental implementation of the induced superconductivity? And if not, what are some of the limiting factor, factors uh, against realizing this? Uh, and the limiting factor is, uh, is not known. <laughs> so these are the, the kind of the challenges. So one is the one question is also that there are some proposals to make pairing, but pairing doesn't necessarily mean superconductivity. Uh, so maybe, Maybe pairing exists and people have, have not been able to, to measure it. Uh, but that, that's kind of one of the issues is that there are uh, these, uh, uh, these proposals. I can actually tell you one of the problems, potential problems with our proposal. Maybe that makes it, that makes it more concrete. And that's the question of excitons. Here we ignore the formation of excitons. Might be uh, it might be it might be competing with the creation of a superconductor, and also in the previous work it was also ignored. In the uh, in the proposal to make uh, Floquet topological insulator in uh, in semiconductors, the formation of exciton was also ignored, uh, and uh, that that's another problem. And, and I, I mentioned the beginning of the talk is that. If you just look at the semiconductor and ignore Coulomb interaction, just based on free carrier, uh, then you should not have any absorption below the band gap. But we all know that <laughs> below the band gap, you have all these Rydberg series of excitons. 
we have to include uh, the Coulomb interaction. So then one, uh, at least it, with this proposal would be that one has to compare the exciton channel and the pairing channel and then see which one would uh, be more relevant. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess along those lines, um, so you have given a number of you know, very inspiring uh, theoretical proposals uh, over the course of your talk. Do you have a sense of which of these is like the closest to, to happening uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> in, 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 in reality? Sure. Um, so the, the 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 deviation from double approximation and this OEM, I think it, the, the one I just uh, chatted with Bubaker, I think that that's the closest one. Um, then uh, enhancement of superconductivity uh, by destroying this charge density wave, I think that's not also very crazy. Uh, these things are uh, borderline science fiction, um, but you know, uh, <laughs> I. Uh, when I when I was thinking about this, you know that uh, all the progress that we had in cold atom uh, was because of a lot of uh, visionary um, theoretical proposal uh, from many many folks, uh, including uh, Peter Zoller, Ignacio Sirac, and company. And it was kind of go back and forth. I know that it was this interesting theoretical proposal, and then it uh, people will follow. So I think there should be a healthy amount of. Uh, a theoretical proposal healthy what amount is healthy this is of course the community should decide um, uh, and uh, and i go back to the first slide that i have we are now dealing with real material uh, in cold atom we are dealing with atoms uh, alkaline atoms that we know them very well uh, their spectrum is very well known here we are dealing with electrons in a in a mess uh, so one has to be more patient. Um, I mean, if, as you say, you know, the problem is there are lots of competing phenomena and how, which one is happening first. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the old question. Exactly. Yeah. Mohammed, I have a question about like uh, an intermediate topic, which I've been trying to understand and read about. And then you, you, you mentioned uh, Thomas Evison. So that made me think of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's this, uh, you know, in chemistry, there are a number of experiments uh, that consider uh, whether chemical reactions inside of optical resonators driven or undriven mm -hmm. uh, might be modified in some fundamental way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what's your, well, I guess for what's your take on that body of work? Like, is it kind of clear what's going on in there? To me, it's kind of unclear. And then uh, is, mm -hmm. does that, do we, is there a way to think of that as like a a useful um, stepping stone to the kind of experiments you're looking at, or maybe, maybe actually it's maybe what you're looking for is more robust in a in a large bulk system than it is in a mesoscopic molecular system. No, I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, um, experiment and, and and a topic to work on. Um, theoretically, uh, I have not uh, followed up very uh, like closely. But one uh, bunch of theoretical works that I read and I could not understand was related to the fact that we model it as a bunch of two-level systems that are coupled to a cavity. So this is my understanding, experts should, should comment, is that a bunch of atoms, so the transport is modeled by the following. I have a bunch of two-level systems that are coupled to each other with some flip-flop interaction. And now I couple them to a, an overall cavity. And now the electron, would not be trapped because of the Anderson localization of these two level systems. It would talk to this global guy, the photon mode, and then it would be enhanced. But then here we are ignoring the fact that this electron, if it's itinerant, it cannot be described by just these two level systems that are talking to a, a cavity mode. Basically, James Cummings model, it might not be actually the right model to think about that. I have to think about an, a current that is coupled to the cavity rather than a bunch of two level systems. Right, which you uh, which you have that J dot A expression. So that exactly would be kind of a right way to parameterize it. So I can see that. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> now, can we have a toy model of like James, James Cummings Hamiltonian for currents such that we can make sense of bad cavity, good cavity limit, et cetera? Uh, that's still missing. And no, that that's that those experiments are are, are certainly useful. Yeah. 
Um, are there more questions uh, from the audience? I think I have a couple I can go into if, if there aren't. One in the chat. I think nothing in the chat. So, um, yeah, so this uh, seminar is part of the uh, CIQC colloquium and the CIQC mission, as I understand it, is to um, address fundamental challenges for the development of the quantum computer. So could you remark maybe on how maybe some of these approaches might lead to new ways of uh, approaching a quantum computer or maybe overcoming existing challenges uh, in current approaches for quantum computer? How does this cavity plus uh, correlated electron uh, physics fit into um, this sort of picture? Yeah, so I, I don't usually have a mission oriented uh, <laughs> uh, research whenever a, a, a problem is interesting, we'll, we'll think about it. And although my, my name, my first name suggested I might have some prophetic uh, uh, vision, but uh, that's, not, that's <laughs> not the case. I don't know how this will, uh, will have an effect. But I, I, at least I can tell you some of the stuff that like happened, like this three-body interaction in ion trap was something that we were thinking about, like Floquet driving the system and then effectively making three-body interaction. But then we realized we, we, with my, my, my colleagues, uh, Zohra Dawoodi and, 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 and company that, well, it actually can be done with ion traps and it might be useful for some lattice case theory implementation. So some of it might be at, actually at intellectual level, uh, not, not necessarily uh, at, the, at the experimental level that some of these uh, techniques that we, we want to use, how to uh, use light to manipulate um, the, um, the non-interacting and interacting part of my Hamiltonians directly has an effect on quantum simulator. How, if we learn how to do them with, uh, with atoms in a, in a cavity, in the cold atom, we might be able to uh, learn something from that for electrons in a cavity. So that, that's kind of, one, one thing. The last one that I put is that can these systems become a, a quantum simulator at some point? We don't know. I mean, uh, you know, now we have a, a bo huge body of work on moiré physics a new development just in the past uh, uh, five, uh, 10 years. And uh, it has exploded. Can the purity and the disorder and the quality of the material come to a level that we can treat them as individual states and, uh, and manipulate them and look at the collective effects. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, another intellectual one I would say is, uh, uh, I said the one third of my group are working on how to measure uh, uh, many body features in a quantum simulator in an efficient way. You don't wanna do uh, uh, a full state tomography every time and be at the, uh, uh, spend an exponential amount of time measuring it. If I'm interested in some uh, order parameter, if I'm interested in some topological invariant, can I measure it more efficiently? I think answering those uh, might be related to answering the, whether we can do them with, with photons in, in an electronic systems. If I have a bunch of spins in a quantum simulator and I want to measure, it, measure them collectively, um, maybe we can do it with the same as the electrons. Um, I, I decided not to give the, the quantum like verification and measurement talk uh, for the QLCI because I thought that it would be a nice uh, semi-orthogonal topic. Uh, this topic would be a semi-orthogonal topic to the QLCI, um, but it is not really. Uh, so in, in, that, in that part, we have a lot of ideas how to use an ancilla, like a global mode to prepare and measure many body uh, states. Uh, and they're kind of the same thing when, uh, when we might be applied them over here. Um, I guess just one last question for me. So on, um, you, you mentioned very briefly this uh, uh, light patterning, patterning on top of the graphing. Um, and how, any, how you can make uh, various lattices like square, triangle, or cosmic. So what, um, what is this kind of model Hamiltonian uh, describing um, that system? Like, what, like uh, as, a, you know, as a potential quantum simulator, what kind of um, 
physics describes uh, uh, that particular thing, since I think you didn't have too much time to mm -hmm. go over it in the main talk. Mm -hmm. um, so at the, the, the minimum level, you just uh, engineer your band. Uh, like uh, you have Hamiltonian that's in, in the absence of light, uh, you just have some dispersion. And now you come with light and then you create a super lattice on it. So in the non-interacting picture, you just uh, uh, drastically modified your band structure. Now, in this case, we looked at the topological features of it, such that you have a trivial band, and now you add light and then you go to a non-trivial band. Mm -hmm. The next step is to ask, okay, what if I add now the Coulomb interaction in the presence of these new bands? If I add the Coulomb interaction, if I flatten the band, let's say, can I enhance some pairing? And that was, was the idea of this, many of this more physics that by, by flattening the band, maybe we are enhancing something, etc. Mm -hmm. So can we do the same thing now with light? And, and the advantage here is dynamical. So you can change the form, you can change the strength in a dynamical way in contrast to passive version that you fabricated and then uh, it's done. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, um, great. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk, Mohammed. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of uh, this part of the discussion section. So uh, now I would uh, ask that students and uh, postdocs uh, stay for um, 